Welcome everybody to session two from the International Symposium in Biological Science. And to start the session, I have an uh, a pleasure to introduce my long late friend, Dr. Fernanda Previero, who uh, got his got her physical education degree at UNESP, uh, UNESP Rio Claro, Brazil. And later, she got a master's degree in physical activity and health at UNESP Rio Claro and a PhD degree in pharmacology at Unicamp. Later, Fernanda got uh, a postdoc on physiology at Medical College of Georgia and uh, a second postdoc on physical activity and health at UNESP Rio Claro. Today, she is a research associate professor at University of South Carolina at the Cardiovascular Translational Research Center. Fernanda has impressive almost 60 publications and her research interests are in the area of pharmacology or non-pharmacological tools for preventing or treating vascular injuries, erectile dysfunction and bladder complications in animal models of diabetes, obesity and hypertension. And it's our pleasure to have Fernanda here with us today to give a very nice lecture and starting the, uh, the activities of this session too. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation, Fernanda. Thank you, Fernanda, for this kind introdu introduction. Uh, are you all seeing my screen? Is everything okay? Yes, we are seeing, Fernanda. Okay. I'd like to uh, start uh, thanking the organizing committee of the International Symposium on Biological Science Sciences uh, for this invitation. It's my great pleasure to be here uh, today and talk a little bit about how the innate immune system can contribute for erectile dysfunction in metabolic disorders, specifically, more specifically, in obesity. So, uh, because I think we have a broad audience, I will start talking a little bit of the background about erectile dysfunction, the anatomy and physiology of the penis and penile erection, and the current therapies for erectile dysfunction. And then I will address the inflammation and how it contributes to activation of the innate immune system uh, in erectile dysfunction and obesity. So, uh, erectile dysfunction is defined as a persistent incapacity to get or maintain or an erection uh, during the sexual intercourse. So when we mention erectile dysfunction, we are specifically talking about male erectile dysfunction. So this happens when a man uh, either loses his erection before the intercourse, or he has only a partial erection, or he has no erection at all. So in terms of numbers, uh, erectile dysfunction has a high prevalence that is associated with aging. So it is shown that 40% of the males in their 40s, they have some level of erectile dysfunction. And these numbers increase in 10% every 10 years. So around 50% of the men in their 50s have some level of erectile dysfunction, 60% of the men in their 60s, and 70% of the men in their 70s. So, uh, and then I also believe that 29% of the remaining men in this age, they are actually lying. Uh, actually, I was a quick search on Google. Uh, it was showing this image and saying that this is what sex is like when someone is in their 70s. So if it is on Google, probably it must be true, right? <laughs> this is just a little bit of joke to break the ice in the beginning of this presentation so we can go deep here for the next steps. 
So uh, I'm going to start talking about the anatomy and the physiology of the pineal erection. This is a transverse section of the penis. And as we can see here, the penis is composed by this uh, corpus spongiosum that it is surrounding the urethra, and this portion of the penis doesn't play a role in the erectile function. But we have these two other cylinders here, the corpora cavernosum, that it is uh, made of smooth muscle, and it is composed by this uh, trabecular smooth muscle in these sinusoid spaces. And this is the portion that it is the erectile tissue. So this corpora cavernosa is, uh, are surrounded by the tunica albuginea, and the tunica albuginea is a fibrous layer of connective tissue. It is rigid, and it plays an important uh, role during the erection. And we also have this uh, emissary veins here that they are responsible to drain the blood out of the penis to the uh, circulation. So uh, during the flaccid state of the penis here, we are just talking about the flaccid state uh, of the penis. We have mainly a role for norepinephrine that is released from adrenergic nerves and stimulate alpha-1 and alpha-2 receptors, uh, increasing in general the intracellular levels of calcium and keeping this tissue in a contractile state. We have other uh, chemicals, uh, neurotransmitters that can play a role like endothelin, prostaglandin F2-alpha. Uh, we have uh, other contractile agents that can keep this tissue in the flaccid state. Upon uh, stimulation, a sexual stimulation, that it can be something visual or it can, can be a thought or uh, a, a touch, what's going to happen in the corpus cavernosum is the relaxation of the smooth muscle with the expansion of the sinusoid spaces. With this, it's going to happen an increase in the blood flow to the penis, in the blood supply to the penis. And these all together are going to compress the emissary veins uh, to keep this blood inside of the corpus cavernosum. Okay, so it's interesting to see that uh, during the erection, there is a compression of, also of the urethra. If we compare the urethra in the flaccid state and the urethra in the uh, erect state, right? Uh, and this is, it makes hard to pee when the penis is erected, okay? So, but uh, we can say that the erection is then given by the vasodilation uh, increase the blood supply to the penis, and it's going to uh, happen an uh, increased uh, intracavernous pressure in, this, in the penis during erection. As we can see, this is a vascular event. The pineal erection is a vascular ev event. So if the erectile dysfunction is not related to a psychological problem, it's organic problems, we are going to call this vasculogenic erectile dysfunction. So uh, the relaxation of the corpus cavernosum is mainly given by the release of nitric oxide. Uh, and this nitric oxide is really released from nerves or endothelial cells, and it diffuses to the smooth muscle, activating the soluble vanilocyclase, uh, increasing the levels of cyclic GMP, and this activates PKG and decreases the concentration of intracellular calcium, causing the relaxation of the smooth muscle. Uh, the cyclic GMP that's formed uh, upon activation of soluble guanylocyclase is degraded by the phosphodiesterase 5 enzyme. And this is actually the target of the current oral medications for erectile dysfunction, right? So the current drugs, they inhibit uh, the Viagra, Tadalafil, uh, they inhibit the phosphodiesterase 5. 
So just so we know, uh, before the discovery of the fossil diesterase 5 inhibitors, uh, the process to treat erectile dysfunction was kind of painful because it was given by intracavernous in, or intraurethral injections of substances like papaverin. It is activator of the AMP, uh, cyclic AMP pathway, uh, or topical creams that were not really very uh, good to get erections, or even with low intensity of extracorporeal shock wave ter therapy. So, after the discovery uh, of the Viagra, the phosphodiesterase type 5 inhibitors became the first line, the gold standard therapy for treating erectile dysfunction. And in case that none of these works, the third line of the treatment for erectile dysfunction is the uh, penile implant. So we know that ab about 80% of the patients with erectile dysfunction respond very well to phosphodiesterase inhibitors. But we still have around 20% 20, 20 of these patients that have other comorbidities such as diabetes mellitus or other cardiovascular diseases, or even those ones that were sub subjected to radical prostatectomy and these patients, they have refractory erectile dysfunction, and they have just a low benefit of the use of the uh, phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors alone. So based on this, we keep trying to find other therapies that, they, that can be adjuvant to this or can even be uh, by themselves a treatment for erectile dysfunction. Uh, this is a little bit of story just to share with you, maybe some of you know, but when Viagra was being first studied by Pfizer, they were testing its effects on hypertension and angina. And actually, when they were in the clinical trials, trials the volunteers started uh, reporting that they had a side effect uh, spontaneous erections. And then Pfizer saw on it the chance of having the first oral treatment for erectile dysfunction. And the reason why I'm bringing this information here is just to show you that cardiovascular diseases and erectile dysfunction actually share common conditions and markers. So all the initiating factors that we see in cardiovascular diseases such as age, sedentarism, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, stress, anxiety, the use of toxic substances or infectious agents, they are also contributing to erectile dysfunction. And they have intermediate events that in general are going to increase the vasoconstriction, decrease the vasodilation, and having remodeling of the vessels. So as I say, erectile dysfunction is a vascular ev event, right? The penile erection is a vascular event and the, the er uh, erectile dysfunction is a problem with the, this vascular event. So at the same time, it is known that the severity of the erectile dysfunction is a a uh, followed by uh, the severity of the cardiovascular diseases. So, the erectile function is evaluated by this international index of erectile function. And it is a questionnaire that has uh, about has 30 questions. And the patients that score less than 21, they are considered uh, a mild uh, level of erectile dysfunction. And when they score less than seven, they have a severe uh, erectile dysfunction. So the lower they score, the more severe is the erectile dysfunction, okay? So here is a graph showing that uh, the level of the International Index for Erectile Dysfunction was higher in patients without coronary artery diseases, but it was really low in patients with coronary artery diseases. And then when they break, break down these numbers, they see that there is a 
correlation observed by the syntax score. The syntax score gives the uh, coronary artery disease severity. So uh, as long as you increase the severity of the coronary artery diseases, as we can see here, you increase the level of the, uh, the severity of the erectile dysfunction. This was made by a Brazilian group. So, but uh, despite this information that we already know that the erectile dysfunction is, the severity of the erectile dysfunction is associated with the level of the uh, cardiovascular complication, here we can see in this graph that uh, the more vessels compromised during the, uh, dur during the coronary artery disease, uh, the highest or the lowest is the score for erectile dysfunction. So there is a positive correlation between the severity of the coronary artery diseases and erectile dysfunction. At the same point that we know that, it's also described in the literature that uh, in here is a study with patients that was made with Asian Indians, and they showed that the patients reported to have uh, erectile dysfunction two to five years before reporting symptoms of cardiovascular diseases. And from this point, we started thinking that actually the erectile dysfunction in patients that don't have cardiovascular diseases can be an early marker for the cardiovascular disease, can be announcing that this patient in the long run are actually not that blunt, not that long, it's going to be in a short term, will present cardiovascular complications. So this is um, also demonstrated by the artery size hypothesis, right? And this is shown that uh, in early stage of arter arteriosclerosis, when we have 50% of, uh, of the obstruction of the artery looming, it is when we start showing the symptoms, the development of symptoms for the disease in that artery. And because the pineal artery is really small, is smaller than the coronary artery, this, uh, in atherosclerosis, this complication will appear first then even in any cardiac symptom that will start in the late stage of the atherosclerosis, okay? When we start getting 50% uh, of obstruction of coronary arteries, right? So this means that the smaller the diameter of the, pina, uh, of the artery, uh, the earlier it's going to be the complication for this. The take-home uh, lesson here is, Size doesn't matter. Actually, girth does. Keep this in mind. So here is another study just showing that the cavernosal dysfunction happens before uh, hypertension. So we have here six weeks, 12 weeks, and 24 weeks for SHR animals. And we can see that these animals with six weeks, they have uh, smaller intracavernous pressure. Uh, compared to the WKY, but they start having an increased uh, blood pressure only when they are 12 weeks old. And the same thing we observe, we observe for endothelial dysfunction and smooth muscle dysfunction when we compare the relaxation of the corpus cavernoso and the aorta in both situ situations. Uh, for endothelium dependent and endothelium independent relaxation. So in the corpus cavernosum, we have six weeks, 12 weeks, and 24 weeks. And only when the animals, uh, uh, when the animals are 12, 12 weeks old, they start having impaired relaxation for both acetylcholine and sodium nitroproside, but not in the aorta, showing one more time that the erectile dysfunction comes first, then the vascular complications in other tissues. Here's the same finding for rats fed with Western diet. So the cavernosal relaxation is impaired with eight weeks, while uh, the relaxation of the coronary artery is impaired only when the animals are uh, 12 weeks 
after feeding high fat diet, Western diet, I'm sorry. So if we know that it's not the cardiovascular complications that are taking, are leading to erectile dysfunction, uh, we, are, we started thinking what else can contribute for this vasculogenic erectile dysfunction, right? And this is a study with patients showing that there are an increase in inflammatory markers in patients with erectile dysfunction independent of uh, coronary uh, ca cardiovascular diseases. So uh, in this study, they showed that the patients without cardio coronary artery diseases have increased levels of IL-1 beta and uh, TNF-alpha, uh, even when they don't present uh, coronary artery diseases. But this not necessarily was related to erectile dysfunction. But other studies have shown that uh, tissues, uh, corp the corpus cavernosum incubated with IL-1 beta for 24 hours showed an impairment in the relaxation to carbacol, which is analog of acetylcholine, right? So, Another study that this one is in collaboration was, was made by Fernando Carneiro from USP Ribeirão and is in collaboration with Professor Fernanda Giacchini. They showed that the infusion with uh, TNF-alpha for, uh, for 14 days caused an increased contraction. And as we can see, as we remember here, the con contraction means the flaccid state. And then an impairment in the relaxation of the corpus cavernosum to electrical field stimulation that was followed by impaired expression of enos and enos. So, question is why and how these inflammatory markers are being released and increased in erectile dysfunction? Everything started changing when uh, Pauli Matzinger brought the idea of the danger model that changes our way to understand how the innate immune system is activated, changing from the stranger model to the danger model. When we started understanding that the uh, debris of the ne necrotic cells or apoptotic cells also are recognized by the immune system and they are now called damage associated molecular patterns, right? And these act, they activate the immune system and the consequence of this activation is the increase of the uh, inflammatory markers. So we started understanding that in chronic situations, in chronic conditions like obesity, hypertension, we have metabolic changes and these metabolic changes are going to increase senescent cells and dying cells, and the products of these dying cells and senescent cells are going to lead to the formation of DAMPs and the activation of these receptors that are from the immune system that we call toll-like receptors, and these will cause the vascular inflammation and sexual dysfunction. So, in obesity, we know that uh, there is an increase in micro, macrophages and toll-like receptors are mainly associated with macrophages. So what we know about toll-like receptors 9 uh, in erectile dysfunction was also shown by Fernando Carneiro for his, by his group, showing that uh, there is a decreased contraction uh, to, of the corpus cavernosum in the presence in animals lacking toll-like receptor 9. So it was the first evidence that toll-like receptor 9 could play a, a role in the corpus cavernosum, right? So uh, here, then it is a study just showing that uh, in obesity, there is an increase in plasma levels and epididymal levels of the debris from the dying cells. In uh, this case, single-stranded DNA, double-stranded DNA, and nucleosome, okay? So they are increased in uh, increasing inflammation. And what we could see from this uh, also, it is that the toll-like receptors are mainly expressed in the macrophage 
when comparing adipocytes, non-macrophage cells and macrophage in the epididymal, uh, in epididymal fat. So for this reason, we started thinking about the role of the toll-like receptors present in the uh, macrophages to increase the levels of uh, TNF-alpha. So our hypothesis was that increased TNF-alpha derived from the activation of toll-like receptors on macrophages could contribute to the erectile dysfunction. So toll-like receptor 9 is expressed in immune cells and it is activated by virus, bacteria or uh, fragments of human DNA. And the product of this is uh, the production of some cytokines. So upon activation, uh, the damage-associated molecular pattern is going to be uptaken I'm sorry, is going to be uptaken, is going to activate the toll-like receptor 9, that's going to use the adapter protein MID88, and to activate NF kappa B and induce the formation of TNF alpha. So in our study, we used a model of mice that is a toll-like receptor 9 mutant, and I'm going to call only mutant. These animals they actually express toll-like receptor 9 in the macrophages, specifically for the macrophage, they express the toll-like receptor, but upon its activation, it's not going to produce TNF-alpha. So we treated animals with high-fat diet uh, for 12 weeks and to get them obese. And after these 12 weeks, we evaluated the corpus cavernosum on contraction and relaxation to electrical field stimulation and phenylephrine and a relaxation to electrical field stimulation in acetylcholine and phenylephrine for contraction. And we also measured uh, protein expression of the uh, proteins related to toll-like receptor activation in the levels of the, uh, the plasma levels of products of cellular damage. So, what we see, we first saw here, it was that the uh, toll-like mutant, toll-like receptor 9 mutant, mutant animals fed with high-fat diet uh, didn't have any difference uh, regarding body weight when compared to the uh, wild-type animals uh, fed high-fat diet. Both of them were similarly increased compared to their respective control animals. We had increased uh, epididymal fat and also increased uh, fasting glucose in the animals fed high fat diet, but the mut mutant animals had a little decrease in these parameters. So when we looked at the uh, contraction, what we saw was that the animals uh, fed high fat diet, but that were mutant, they had a decreased contraction, showing that uh, somehow the toll-like receptor 9 is participating in controlling this uh, contraction of the corpus cavernosum. We did not observe this difference in the contraction induced by electrical field stimulation, but we could, could see increased contraction in animals fed high-fat diet when stimulated with KCL, and this was uh, prevented in the toll-like receptor 9 mutant animals. So then we analyzed the relaxation of the corpus cavernosum, and for this relaxation we didn't see any difference when the, uh, it was stimulated by acetylcholine, but we saw that animals fed high-fat diet have a decrease in the relaxation induced by electrical field stimulation, that's basically nitric oxide derived from the nerve, but when these animals are mutant and fed high-fat diet, it doesn't ha happen. This effect was prevented. What we saw was this effect was also followed by a decrease in um, the expression of N-NOS in high-fat diet animals, but it was prevented in the uh, mutant animals. So then we were like, okay, let's see how is the expression of the the TNF alpha in the corpus cavernosum of these animals. And what we could see was that the uh, wild type mouse fed high fat diet presented an increase 
in the TNF alpha in the corpus cavernosum, but this effect was prevented in the mutant animals. There was no difference in the TNF alpha receptor in these in any of the treatments. Here, we decided to measure the expression of the toll-like receptor 9 in the corpus cavernosum, and we didn't see any difference. Uh, but again, our animals are mutant, and the, the deletion or the change is not even in the toll-like -like receptor expression, and it is specifically in the macrophage. So we were not expecting actually to see uh, something too different from this. And then we looked at the downstream proteins here, and we looked at the MID88, and we didn't see any difference in the expression or activation of this pathway in the corpse cavernosum, and not even the activation of NF kappa B, showing that this is not happening in the corpse cavernosum specifically, but it is somewhere else. So we decided to check if there was increased expression of the macrophages in the corpus cavernosum and when we did this we used the f480 uh, as a marker for macrophages in this situation we also didn't see increased expression of the macrophages in the corpus cavernosum but here we have a limitation because uh, they are expressing the same levels but we have we, we may have a different polarization uh, towards a pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory macrophages in, in the tissue, right? And here is just the, uh, a pain marker for inflammation in the corpus cavernosum also, and we couldn't see uh, increased inflammation in the corpus cavernosum specifically. So, question is, what's triggering the toll-like receptor activation in obesity? And we know that mitochondrial DNA primes toll-like receptor signaling. Here is a study showing that mitochondrial DNA in high-fat diet uh, uh, amplif amplify the toll-like receptor 9 signaling. And here is another stu study showing that M uh, HMGB1, which is a nuclear protein, is also able to activate uh, the toll-like -like receptor 9. So we decided to measure the, this nuclear protein in ND6, that it is a, a mitochondrial DNA uh, product, and we saw that there was an increase in the expression of the uh, HMGB1 and ND6 in the plasma of the animal's fed high-fat diet. But this effect didn't happen in the toll-like receptor animal's fed high-fat diet, showing here that there is an increase in the uh, products of cellular damage in the plasma of these animals, but not in the animals that are mutant. So we also measured the circulating levels of TNF-alpha, uh, and we didn't see, it seems that, uh, it was increasing, but we didn't see any significant increase in the plasma levels of TNF-alpha in these tissues. So uh, from our study then, we can conclude that in obesity, there is an increase in the circulating levels of NAD6 and HMGB1. That's going to activate the toll-like receptor 9 in the macrophages and it induce the formation of TNF-alpha. And as demonstrated before, this TNF-alpha is going to inhibit uh, NNOS and impair the relaxation of the corpus cavernosum. So when we block this toll-like receptor 9, we have the reduction of this TNF-alpha and then one improvement of the relaxation of the corpus cavernosum. So, I'm over my time already, and I'm going to skip the future perspectives, and I'm just going to thank for everyone that collaborated with me in this study and the funding agencies that uh, are essential for us to keep working. Thank you very much. Fernanda, thank you very much for all this very nice information you brought to the audience. I think uh, the data you, you, you brought will educate all the audience regarding um, erectile dysfunction, which nowadays we recognize as a, a risk factor for this cardiovascular disease, upon all the things you, you showed us. 
and make us aware of uh, all the consequences of not uh, treating all the causes that may elicit uh, this vascular uh, dysfunction that will um, compromise every child function later. So we have some questions from the audience here. And here with me is Dr. James from uh, University uh, UFG, uh, who will help me making the questions. And the first one comes from uh, João Batista, who is acknowledging you for this great lecture. And he wants to know uh, regarding some uh, some evidences linking angiotensin II with uh, in erectile dysfunction. So, uh, thank you for your question. Yeah, the, this is very uh, interesting. We don't know specific, specifically for tau-like receptor 9, but what we know from the literature regarding angiotensin 2 and erectile dysfunction is an activation of tau-like receptor 4. Uh, that has been demonstrated that when you inhibit tau like receptor 4 in animals treated with angiotensin 2, you will have the recovery of the erectile function. Uh, for Specifically for tau like receptor 9, uh, considering all the inflammation and all the activation of reactive oxygen species with angiotensin 2, uh, I think that probably it plays a role if I uh, understood your question. Thank you very much. The next question, I, I believe it's from Manuel or Carlos. Um, he's acknowledging the presentation as well. And he's asking about the endothelial function in this uh, tall nine mutant mice treated with high fat diet. Have you addressed the, the vascular in the, in the failure function in the vasculature? No, we actually haven't done that. Uh, we had at those days very busy lab and lots of people working and working in shifts. So it would be really interesting that if we could have taken the vessels of these animals to evaluate uh, the vasculature, it would be really interesting, but we couldn't do that at this time we were working with prostate also so mm -hmm. we saw the same results but not for vascular endothelial function specifically but i think the electric field stimulation uh, for the re relaxation response that you showed that was impaired is a clue uh, yeah. that somehow nitric oxide is is compromised yes i think so uh Actually, what we are trying to do now when we work with erectile dysfunction is to keep working with the pudendal artery, mm -hmm. then we, because the pudendal artery is the artery supplying blood for the corpus cavernosum, right? And yeah. it is a small diameter as well. Uh, and, but for this specifically, we didn't do, but usually what we see for the pudendal artery is it is what we see in the, in the corpus cavernosum. So okay. it is a clue that we have uh, endothelial dysfunction and it's going to be recovered in the mutant animals. And probably what I think is that um, since uh, you see this, this difference in the erectile function, probably for the vasculature it will take a little longer, maybe a longer treatment with the high fat diet to see a, a very robust uh, yeah. Yeah this, is, yeah, this, yeah, this is possible. Sometimes we need two more weeks of treatment to observe these things in the in the vasculature. Uh, but now it's just speculation. We haven't tried. Fernanda, uh, I think we have time for one more question before our next speaker. And it's one from me, from myself. <laughs> I was wondering, uh, where is this um, HMGB1 and MG6 coming from? Uh, do you have a clue? Because TN systemic TNF alpha levels seems not to, to be the difference here, right. only locally. Uh, and this would be the trigger for this response. So do you have a clue where this is coming from? Well, uh, 
to our understanding, and I think that we just could get to this situation if we were uh, kind of treating the animals uh, to make them to lose weight, but it is that the obesity is uh, causing the cells to die because it is usually we have senescent, more senescent cells, like the cells start to get older uh when they are younger than it was supposed to be right and then we think that uh all these uh metabolic changes are causing damages to the cell and the cells are dying so what we are having here is more cells dying but we also could have measured uh apoptotic cells yes and uh, well the problem is because these ideas they just come after we did a lot and then we don't have more material to keep uh, studying and getting the answers. Okay. So, yeah, I think this is a very nice uh, possibility and we will open a new room for therapies maybe because yes. uh, today we are treating the problem per se, but we can start treating what is leading the, the problem. Yes, that's true. And in the future perspectives, I was going to mention that there is already some studies that they are showing the use of uh, TNF antagonists, the Eternacept, uh, blocking and improving the erectile function in patients. So what I think it is interesting. But in my future, I'm intending to work uh, with physical activity for these animals because we showed the physical activity improves erectile function, right? But now I want to know how the physical activity can modulate the immune, uh, innate mm -hmm. immune system. So yeah. I think you, you have more power to, uh, to keep people inside the gym and making walks <laughs> and running. I think this will be a, a nice start for people to becoming more active. Yes, there's, there is a good reason. <laughs> yes. Fernanda, okay. it was a pleasure to 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 be uh, to share this time with you. Send my my best regards to Clinton and to all oh, your team, and keep going because your work is very important to everybody. And we are very mm -hmm. proud of all the things you are doing over there. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Thank you one more time. So, James, uh, I will leave you to introduce our now next speaker. And I'd like to thank you for sharing this session with me. It's a pleasure to, to be with you here. Fernanda, thank you. It's an immense opportunity to be able to be, uh, to share this uh, session with you. Uh, in continuation of our International Symposium on Biological Sciences, we are going to take a virtual and scientific trip now from US to Canada. Yeah. So maybe you might be wondering what kind of trip. So uh, I have a great honor uh, to present a very distinguished speaker that is on this trip today, Professor Annie Monique. Uh, Professor Annie is from uh, CHUSJ Research Center, University of Montreal. She's a medical doctor by training full-time professor at the Department of Pediatrics and associate member at the Department of Physiology with many awards, distinctions, fellowships, opportunities, and impact, impactful preclinical and clinical publications. Our research interests include the developmental origins of health and disease, long-term cardiovascular consequences of preterm birth. Please join me in welcoming Professor Annie as she presents a lecture on oxygen-induced cardiomyopathy in newborn rats, a model for adult cardiac disease after preterm birth. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to nearly be there with you and to uh, see those nice presentation. Do you see my screen now? It's in the, do you see it well? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Yes. Okay. Do you see it? Yes. Okay, excellent. So I will start my presentation. 
So uh, thank you very much again. So I'm in uh, Montreal, Quebec, Canada. We do not have snow yet, but we have a beautiful autumn with the yellow leaves. Um, so I'm going to talk to you uh, about uh, my preferred topic because by training, yes, I'm a medical doctor, but I'm a pediatrician and I take care about a premature infant in the neonatal intensive care unit. And with my colleague, Dr. Lou, we decided to uh, question what happens to our little patient as they grow and they become adults, and maybe one day they will have family themselves. How is their health going? Why do we ask this question? Well, we know preterm birth occurs at a critical time of development um, in the middle of the, the end of the second trimester and throughout the third trimester, it can happen there and infant can survive. We all know that preterm birth will have an impact on the brain, for sure, on the lungs. We've heard about it. But we started to examine uh, what happens to the cardiovascular system in the kidneys. So today I will focus on the cardiovascular system. Why is it important? Well, in uh, humans, the heart, for example, and the cardiomyocytes are still in active proliferation at the time of uh, premature delivery because usually the uh, cardiomyocyte proliferation will go up to term. So when they're born preterm, the altered conditions that they have in the neonatal intensive care could alter um, their heart development. Uh, indeed, uh, this is a study out of Oxford in a cohort of young adults who were born around 30 weeks. The normal gestation in humans is 40 weeks. Uh, what they saw when they were adults, on average about 25 years, if I recall, the left ventricle of the um, Adults who were born preterm here in blue was kind of smaller and the walls were thicker. This is a study by Adam Lewandowski in uh, Oxford. The other uh, interesting thing is that uh, there seems to be an increased susceptibility to stressors in uh, individuals who were born preterm. Here is a study out of Sweden looking at heart failure over um, uh, childhood and young adulthood. And what they saw is that even though heart failure in these young persons without any congenital heart disease is a rare occurrence, what they saw is that among those with heart failure, there was a clear overrepresentation of individuals or children and young adults who were born themselves preterm, suggesting are they more susceptible than the term ones to uh, what can cause heart failure in childhood, and most often it's the viral infection. Uh, when we go beyond the age of 20 and all the way to the age of 45, so relatively still young adults, we also see that there's a increased incidence of heart failure among those who were born uh, late, very preterm or extremely preterm compared to those who were born uh, full term. Um, so there's, uh, um, we got interested to understand what happens to the heart of these uh, preterm. And uh, I will show you mainly uh, data from our animal uh, model. But to start, I will also uh, show you why it's important to try to understand what happens with the cardiovascular phenotype of these individuals born preterm it probably doesn't resemble exactly what we see usually with the cardiovascular risk factors we have in the general population. So um, to underline this, what I just said is, I will show you some data about the HAPI cohort. The HAPI cohort stands for Health of Adult Preterms Investigation. It's a cohort who was born mainly at our hospital between 1987 and 1996. Uh, below 29 weeks of gestation, so that's quite preterm, and wh whom we've recruited to come back for a full health checkup between the age of 20 and 29. And they had to come with a friend or a sibling who was the same sex and same age to them, so it would control for uh, life habit and socioeconomic uh, factors. What we saw is in our cohort of 100 and term young adults, and, 100 and uh, 101 uh, preterm born uh, young adults. The preterm were born on average at 27 weeks. They were weighing only 900 grams. When, they, when we saw them as adults, um, the preterm were um, shorter, lighter, 
their body surface area was smaller, their blood pressure was a little higher, as well as their heart rate. Um, but, and, and overall, they had a, a, a significantly increased risk, even at the age of 23 on average, to be diagnosed um, with the hypertension stage one, uh, some degree of glucose intolerance, as well as airflow limitation. But the first thing here that is interesting is that in our cohort, the adiposity was the risk for adiposity was not increased in the preterm. So this is something a little unusual for uh, a group of person who would have a higher incidence of hypertension. And when we examine whether there is a co-occurrence of adiposity and hypertension or uh, hypertension and glucose intolerance, usually these two elements, they go hand in hand in the general population. What we saw is that indeed in the term ones in green, um, those two elements were uh, significantly associated, but not in the, in the preterm. So uh, the, those with hypertension were not at high risk to have adiposity compared to the term. And this was a little uh, surprising to us. The other thing that was surprising is that we examined quite a a number of biomarkers of inflammation as well as of oxidative stress in this cohort. And you know that um, it's well known in general population studies that uh, biomarkers of inflammation and oxidative stress are increased when you have higher risk factors for uh, cardiovascular diseases. And it was not at all the case in this uh, cohort. The preterm and the term had exactly the same um, uh, values for all these um, factors. Therefore, there seems to be a specific pathway to increase susceptibility to cardiovascular diseases following preterm birth. And for this presentation, I will focus on the cardiac um, element to this. And we going to our animal model to study this a little bit more. We're going to examine what, what uh, uh, happens with the renin angiotensin system and what happens with the mitochondria, which is a, a key element in heart function, as you all know. So the animal model we use is uh, uh, newborn rats. Um, they stay with their uh, mom, their, their dam, and they're exposed to 80% oxygen from day three to day 10 of life. Um, this model is interesting, the rat model, because when they are born, the rat pups, they are obviously term for rats. However, many of their organs are not fully developed. And in fact, they had the similar stage of development than the ones we see, than what we see in uh, very preterm infants. So by exposing them to high oxygen, um, we kind of reproduce what happens upon birth because preterm, um, babies who are born preterm, you in utero, in the, the mothers, the, the PO2 is quite low in fact. And it's only when the babies are reaching term that their antioxidant system is ready to face the high increase in PO2 that there is normally when uh, one is born. The uh, preterm infants, when they're born, their antioxidant system is not ready to face this major rise in circulating PO2. So here in the rat model, what we do is that we, we trigger this relative hyperoxia by exposing the animals to 80% oxygen from day three to day 10 of life. What we've previously reported is that these animals at four weeks when they're weaned from the mother, their blood pressure is normal, but starting at seven weeks, their blood pressure is significantly increased, both systolic and diastolic. What we also uh, saw is that at four weeks, so before any blood pressure change, we saw that the cardiomyocyte surface area was significantly increased in the oxygen exposed animals. I realize the graph here is at 16 weeks, but we did see that also at four weeks. So, and at 16 weeks, as you can see here, this remains. So there is cardiomyocyte surface area, which is increased, uh, which implies um, hypertrophy. And the other element which we saw at both four and 16 weeks is fibrosis. There's a significant increase in fibrosis. Uh, at seven weeks, when blood pressure starts to rise, we do see by echo dilated left ventricular cavity and systolic and diastolic dysfunction. We will examine this a bit more in a few slides. What's interesting is that 
I'll just go back a minute. This uh, studies were done by Catherine Zdarzyk and published in 2008. And these important data looking at cardiomyocyte hypertrophy and fibrosis were done by um, one of your compatriot, Dr. Mar Mariani Bertagnoli, when she was doing her postdoc in my lab in uh, 2014 and 17. And it's uh, recently, last summer, in fact, in 2021, that Adam Lewandowski, again from uh, Oxford, examined the heart of young adults uh, born preterm and examined specifically evidence for fibrosis and did find fibrosis. So uh, what we this is uh, showing that the animal model that we are using is worth it to try to understand what happens in the uh, in the individuals born preterm. Um, so going back to our animal model, Marianne Bertagnoli examined the, the 81 expression, which you see here on the left, in the animals that I just, in the heart of the animals I just showed you. And what she saw is that at four weeks, there was no difference in the uh, 81 receptor, but at 16 weeks, it was significantly increased. What was um, both 81A and 81B, but was also interesting was that the 82 receptor was decreased both at four and 16 weeks, uh, both the protein and the mRNA, therefore leading to an imbalance uh, between 81A increase and, and uh, 81 receptor, I'm sorry, increased and 82 receptor decreased. So in favor of the pro-fibrotic, pro-inflammatory and pro-hypertrophy element of the arm of the renin angiotensin system. Uh, what Mariani Bertinelli did uh, do after that is that she challenged the animals by a low-dose uh, infusion of angiotensin II, which was um, infused by osmotic mini-pump from week 12 to week 16 of uh, life. What she saw, and she did cardiac echo to the animals, examining left ventricular contractility and left ventricular relaxation uh, after two and after four weeks of uh, perfusion. What you can see is that the animals who, are, who were in room air, so the control animals, after two weeks of uh, low-dose angiotensin II infusion, not much happens, and then contractility starts decreasing at four weeks. What we see in the animals who had been exposed to oxygen is that to start off, the contractility is a little lower, there's a compensatory increase at two weeks and a clear failure here heart failure um, at four weeks. And a reciprocally left ventricular relaxation shows a similar pattern with, I would, a, a trying to compensate at two weeks and a clear failure at four weeks compared to the control animals who are able to uh, relatively so maintain themselves. So showing here that um, these animals have an increased susceptibility to heart failure after being confronted with this a pro-hypertensive and pro-inflammatory um, effect of the angiotensin II infusion. So I did show you that we have fibrosis, we have hypertrophy, and we have dilated cardiomyopathy and increased uh, susceptibility to heart failure. So what can we do? <clears throat> the next uh, study that was done is to try to um, prevent uh, these perhaps long-term effects uh, that were mediated by an overactivation of the AT1 receptor. This was our postulate. So again, Marianne Bertagnoli uh, gave Lozartan from the 8 to 10 uh, by gavage to the animals to prevent, aiming to prevent cardiac hypertrophy and fibrosis and examine the animals at uh, four weeks. We gave Lozartan um, at the 8 to 10. The oxygen exposure is from the 3 to 10. This is to avoid the period of nephrogenesis, which uh, still goes on in these animals um, up to about day six, seven of life. And uh, what we saw was that the animals who received Lozartan were in the gray bar here for the oxygen exposed. Um, there was a reduction or normalization, even I would say, of the heart to body weight ratio, which is not the way of examining cardiac uh, hypertrophy. Uh, also, in when we examine um, uh, tissue sections, both the right ventricle and the left ventricle, there was hypertrophy uh, in the oxygen-exposed animals, which was um, uh, totally prevented uh, in those who had received two days of uh, losartan at the end of the oxygen exposure. 
Also, what we saw was that the fibrosis, both in the right and the left ventricle, was uh, reduced. Uh, well, the fibro was high in the right ventricle, but it was reduced only in the left ventricle um, of the animals who received uh, losartan in addition to being exposed to oxygen. So um, it's interesting, and there might be a role for RAS medication as a first-line cardiovascular management of adults born preterm. But whether uh, this is um, uh, th this specifically has not been examined, so nobody has designed a study to, let's say, treat hypertension or cardiac hypertrophy in individuals born preterm. How do they respond to RAS medication? Do they respond better? Do uh, should it be combined with something else? This has not been studied, and we think it's important because this seems, as I said, to have a specific pathophysiology. Then um, the other uh, element that we've examined is the angiotensin 1 to 7 and alamandine treatment aiming to prevent the development of cardiac alteration induced by neonatal high oxygen exposure. Here again, this is a work by Marianne Bertagnoli and Daniela D'Artora. Uh, both also from Brazil and both here uh, in Montreal. Um, so uh, uh, orally active angiotensin 1 to 7 and alamandine were kindly provided to us by Professor Santos and were given by Gavage from uh, day 3 to day 10 of life, so during the whole exposure to oxygen. Um, the uh, animals uh, were examined here at the very end of the oxygen exposure. What we saw was the we could not uh, see any difference in the left ventricular mass. Oh, I should stop here and tell you that the first three bars on the left are the animals who were in room air, and the three bars on the right are the animals who were exposed to high oxygen. Those receiving um, um, just the vehicle are um, in regular bar. These ones in the middle were the ones who were received angiotensin 1 to 7, and the ones on the right are the ones who received uh, alamanti. Uh, what we saw here was that uh, cardiomyocyte surface area um, was increased indeed in the animal who were exposed to uh, high oxygen at 10 days of life. And this was totally prevented by both angiotensin 1 to 7 and alamandine. What was a bit surprising to us was that alamandine also had an effect in the control animals. And you, in fact, we can expect that when we um, give medication or a, a, any treatment to animals who have no problem to start with, we might end up some effect of disequilibrium of something else. So anyway, we have to take this uh, into account here when we would consider doing clinical translation, but the interesting element here was that both angiotensin 1 to 7 and alamandine were able to prevent the uh, cardiomyocyte hypertrophy at 10 days of uh, life. Then we examine these animals also at one month, so P28, 28 days of life. And uh, again, the hypertrophy protection was maintained by both uh, angiotensin 1 to 7 and alamandine. And the fibrosis as well, which I hadn't shown you at uh, 10 days, but the fibrosis here uh, is significantly increased in the animals who were exposed to oxygen and prevented in the animals who receive uh, angiotensin 1 to 7 or alamandine in addition to being exposed to oxygen. So this is interesting to observe. If we uh, uh, examine a little closer elements of the uh, other elements of the renin angiotensin system. So here we have ACE mRNA at peak, so at 10 days, ACE mRNA is significantly increased in those who have received, were exposed to oxygen, and this is prevented by both angiotensin 1 to 7 and alamandine. For the expression of AT1 uh, receptor mRNA, we also have this significant increase that we've seen before, which is a little bit prevented uh, mostly by alamandine and not by angiotensin 1 to 7. Uh, AT2 receptor uh, in this uh, situation is not decreased, but increased. You know, it, it's a different experiment. And there was no effect by, um, there was no effect uh, by uh, any of the treatment. Uh, I'm sorry, I had not shown you, in fact, the result of an AT2 receptor at P10, but uh, a little later, if I well recall. 
So um, back on track. So here, um, ACE2 uh, protein expression and mass protein expression, again, at 10 days, what we can see is that ACE2 protein expression was significantly reduced in the animals who were exposed to oxygen. And there was uh, no more effect of oxygen in the animals which had received uh, angiotensin 127 or alamadine. So here also, we could conclude to a certain protective effect. Um, in the mass uh, protein expression, we have a surprising uh, effect, which is by giving angiotensin 127 in both the room air and the oxygen exposed animal, we have an increase in its own receptor uh, and no change uh, otherwise that I cannot explain. At uh, 28 days, so long after the oxygen exposure is finished, um, in the 81 receptor mRNA, uh, we also here see surprisingly that angiotensin 127 and alamandine both increase the 81 mRNA uh, receptor, whereas 82 is increased by angiotensin 127. So what, and, and there's no effect in the high oxygen exposed group. So this means that when we play around a system, we might end up having effects that we don't necessarily anticipate that are difficult to explain. Uh, with the ACE2 protein, uh, what we have is a significant reduction in the animals which were exposed to oxygen, which was here prevented by the two uh, molecules and the same uh, unusual pattern of angiotensin 127 leading to a increased uh, expression of its own receptor. Um, so uh, what we see um, here is that uh, we have an increased activity of the 81 branch uh, arm of the renin angiotensin system. We seem to have some protective effects, at least for the cardiomyocyte hypertrophy, the fibrosis, and to a certain extent, the expression of the components of the renin angiotensin system through uh, providing angiotensin 127 and alamandine to the animals. And, and this was at the same time of the oxygen exposure. So it's more a prevention treatment than really a curative treatment later on. Um, now we're, we're going to switch gear a little bit and, and see what happens to mitochondrial function. Uh, why study mitochondrial function uh, in the heart of a preterm individual, or at least in our model? Well, um, in uh, humans and, and in animal models of hypertension resulting in heart failure, we know that uh, conditions associated with card myocardium remodeling, cardiomyocyte hypertrophic growth and fibrosis, and resulting in heart failure are really associated with mitochondrial dysfunction. What is also interesting to know is that upon birth, um, this is this square here, um, in order to phase the major increase in the workload that the left ventricle has to do when the baby is born, because the placenta, which is a very low resistance organ, is cut off, the res peripheral resistance increases, the left ventricle has to increase quite a bit its work. There's a shift there in the energy production by the mitochondria from glycolysis, which is decreasing, to oxidative phosphor, more effective oxidative phosphorylation, which increases. Therefore, we postulated that with preterm birth occurring when we suspect the heart is not absolutely ready, there might be a postnatal mitochondrial maladaptation and maybe perpetuated dysfunction. So uh, this is a uh, work uh, realized by uh, Daniela Dartora in the laboratory. Um, in where she examined left ventricular mitochondria ultrastructure morphology and integrity after neonatal um, uh, exposure to a high oxygen. And here the animals were studied at uh, four weeks. What we saw was that there were many indices of altered morphological uh, integrity and uh, al um, there were morphological alterations and reduced structural integrity that we could see here better in the um, electron microscopy images. These are nice lined mitochondria of the control animals. And here you can see the mitochondria, the cristae are somewhat disrupted. The mitochondria uh, are not as regular. 
if we measure the area of uh, average mitochondria, it's reduced in the oxygen exposed animals. The, the, they are smaller. The percentage of the cardiomyocyte area covered by the mitochondria is also significantly reduced um, compared to the control animals. And when we examine whether those smaller mitochondria uh, do their job as efficiently, well, the answer is no. And the bioenergetics shows a reduced uh, consumption, uh, oxygen consumption rate, both at baseline and state three in the um, animal, in the uh, mitochondria isolated from the left ventricle of uh, oxygen exposed uh, animals. Interestingly, also, because this is involved in the um, maintenance of glycolysis as a source of energy versus oxidative phosphorylation, HIF1 alpha was found to be increased in the uh, our animal model. <clears throat> uh, therefore, I'm sure the question you're asking is, uh, well, um, this is, uh, there are, seems to be mitochondrial changes. What if uh, those angiotensin 1 to 7 is able to modulate mitochondrial function in these animals? Well, this is the next presentation that Carolina will present to you. So in uh, conclusion, uh, and my key messages are that disrupted organ development, here we're talking about the heart, and impaired adaptation to challenges probably contribute to increased cardiac disease risk uh, in individuals born preterm, probably through uh, the renin angiotensin system activation at the level of the heart, including hypertrophy fibrosis, um, impaired cardiomyocyte bioenergetics, and it will be interesting to see what we can do for this. And uh, I think you're convinced that translational teamwork, examining what happens in the patients, and then going back to the lab to examine uh, how we can translate this to the animal model is really essential to inform what we could test as prevention and therapies tailored to these individuals born preacher. I would like to thank some of the happy uh, participants here. They are all these uh, uh, very uh, nice uh, young adults. They're they are holding their own baby picture when they were themselves in the neonatal intensive care unit. And I would like to acknowledge Dr. Lou here, uh, with whom I do uh, all my research program, as well as uh, Daniela D'Artora, Marianne Bertagnoli, she's not on the picture, Ying He no, uh, neither, Annie Cloutier, uh, Jessica Bonetto, Rafael Fernandez, and Carolina, who is here, who you, who will, you will see next. Thank you. So, Professor Annie, uh, I thank you for sharing with us uh, this very important contribution uh, from your team, teamwork and findings there of high impact. And I can see here there's already there's a question uh, from uh, Professor Manuel thanking you uh, for this beautiful presentation. Uh, he is asking that, do you know what type of collagen is more increased with oxygen exposed newborn rats, especially between collagen and uh, collagen one and three? Well, well, I know we've looked at it and in all honesty, right now I forget, but it's published. I'm sorry for this silly answer. <laughs> That's okay. I I'm think sorry. That, and wait. one thing that I didn't say, but, um, oh, you know what? No, we did not. Uh, did we see in the heart? I know we looked also in the aorta. We also saw collagen was increased in the aorta as well as in the heart. And in the aorta, we also saw that the elastin was decreased. So that was also interesting in the context of high blood pressure. Uh, before taking the next question, I, I have a personal one here. While I was looking at the model, I was kind of, I mean, is a very fascinating models, but what comes to my mind was uh, uh, how successful is this model in terms of number of animals that you need to use to establish some of these cardiovascular events? Well, like, so in the in the uh, animal model, uh, we could see uh, significant differences. Everything that I showed you was done on average with about 
six to eight animals per group. So I think it follows the, the, the usual um, things we see in cardiovascular physiology. The other thing we have to say is that, in fact, the animals, they come by litters. So they come with the mother, with the 12 pups, six males, six females. And uh, we never take more than two pups per litter because otherwise we're just studying the same family and we cannot conclude from this. Yeah, two pups per litter. Thank you. All right. So uh, here is another question from uh, Professor Mano once again, uh, asking that have you analyzed cardiomyocytes proliferation in, the, in these animals? Yeah, that's, uh, that's really clearly the next step. Uh, I totally agree with you. We have a student right now doing this. The preliminary data looking at chi 67 indeed indicates that proliferation is reduced, but we need to work at that uh, more. And uh, uh, so not only is proliferation reduced, is it prolonged? Therefore, because it's reduced, do we, have, do we end up with a decreased number of cardiomyocytes? What, a, what about the other cells that are in the tissue? These are all uh, very important questions that we absolutely need to look at. Thank you. From the beginning, I, I, I understand in, in the course of the introduction, while well, you're talking about preterm birth's impact on cardiovascular and uh, on brain. Uh, and I was actually thinking about is preterm birth, I know you didn't talk about that, but I just want to take advantage of you being, you've been, you've been doing a lot of uh, pre, uh, clinical researches. Uh, do you think uh, preterm birth is a kind of risk factor for number of psychiatric diseases yes losing yeah you know it's true um uh, I'm, I'm i'm not an expert in that type of uh, research but it is true we we do have a little bit of well i w i don't i'm not sure about the psychiatric diseases but i'm sure about the uh, they have different psychological traits uh, and I'm not talking about the neurodevelopmental issues. I'm just talking about psychological traits. But um, anyway, in the populations that uh, we followed, uh, they're just doing their own lives. They're translators, nurses, uh, social workers, uh, PhD students. Yeah. So uh, in, in our population, uh, we did not uh, see a concordance between uh, mental illness and the cardiovascular elements that we measured. Great. Uh, another question here from Professor Diego is thanking you. And uh, he wants to know uh, if it is possible that the angiotensin 1-7 also influence uh, mitochondria function in adults who develop heart failure? Well, this is what Carolina is looking at. <laughs> She's the next presentation. <laughs> James, do, do we have a time for a question? I think uh, we're done. I, oh, uh, Dr. Anne Monique? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. So when is Pre uh, preterm uh, babies are born, they are offered to an abundant environment with oxygen. And probably their antioxidative mechanisms may be not as mature as a regular baby would be. Uh, this would be a cause, for example, for this uh, mitochondrial dysfunction, um, releasing a lot of uh, oxygen uh, ROS, uh, formation, maybe they are not prepared to to counteract all of this oxidative uh, environment that is created by this abundant oxygen uh, environment. I was wondering. Yes, if well, that makes that's sense. <laughs> yes, that's really our hypothesis um, it, because logically we know mitochondria they can generate reactive oxygen species, but they can also be damaged by oxygen, reactive oxygen species. So there's been some studies in um, 
newborn in the neonatal intensive care, trying certain antioxidants. So far, they have not been conclusive. It's We know that oxidative stress, a certain degree of oxidative stress is also critical for cell multiplication, cell yeah, development, perfect. cell function. So it's a very um, special equilibrium that we have to maintain in which we do not arm, um, but still let them grow and develop. So, but it, it remains a, a topic of research, of clinical research in the neonatal intensive care. What is the right cocktail, antioxidant cocktail to help them uh, not develop complication from that preterm birth? Yeah, I agree with you. Thank you very much. So, uh, thank you once more for your support uh, to our internationalization drive and training. Uh, you have been uh, very actively involved. So we really appreciate all you do for science. So and that's- Thank you. Thank you very much. I salute all my friends in Brazil. Thank Bye. you. Thank you, Dr. Noah. Bye-bye. <laughs> So uh, we move to the next presentation. Uh, I think uh, Professor Ani has made a very good uh, grand work. So uh, the next presenter is going to be Caroline, Carolina Nobri Ribeiro. Upon this, she graduated in biomedi biomedical sciences with master's degree in biological sciences at the Federal University of Goiás. And she had a sandwich year at uh, SJUHC, Montreal, Canada. She is currently a PhD candidate in the graduate program in biological sciences. Carolina, kindly proceed with your talk entitled Angiotensin 1-7 Improves Cardiac Left ventricular bioenergetics and mitochondrial function in a rat model of neonatal high oxygen induced cardiomyopathy. Thank you, James. Thank you, Dr. Nui, for your very nice introduction of my study. So hello, everyone. My name is Carolina. I'm a PhD student from the graduate program of biological sciences. My advisor is Dr. Carlos Henrique de Castro, and today I'm going to present you the results of the project that I developed during my sandwich internship in Dr. Anne Monique's lab in Montreal, Canada. And as James already said, I'll talk, I'll talk about the effects of angiotensin 1 to 7 in this mitochondrial dysfunction observed in the oxygen-induced cardiomyopathy. So it, it is known that globally, 10% of all the births of all the infants are born preterm uh, with less than 37 weeks of the gestation, and about 1% of those are extremely preterm, uh, being born before 28 weeks. So as Dr. Nui already showed us, the prematurity has both short and long-term consequences, and the risk for, for the heart failure is one of the most important. And some studies show that in the neonatal heart that is born at term, the maturation stage of the heart in the first days of life is equivalent to the human heart in the last trimester of pregnancy that is abruptly interrupted by the preterm birth. And by subjecting the, these rats to high oxygen levels in these first days of life, we can reproduce the relative hyperox hyperoxic stress that is encountered by preterm infants upon birth. And also these animals develop the an oxygen induced cardiomyopathy, uh, which is characterized by the by a pathological cardiac remodeling, the hypertrophy and fibrosis, the a left ventricular dysfunction, and also systolic and diastolic dysfunction. And here we can see the study made by Mariani Bertagnoli that uh, showing a 
a bigger cardiomyocyte surface and fibrosis in the animals exposed to hyperoxy. Also, this cardiac transition to the extrauterine life requires a significant bioenergetics and mitochondrial adaptation to meet these new energetic demands that are triggered, especially by the increase in the oxygen concentration, the peripheral resistance, also uh, increased cardiac output and a new, uh, bigger cardiac energy requirement. This in this sense, Daniela D'Artora, an associate researcher in the group, found that the oxygen-induced cardiomyopathy was also accompanied by a cardiac mitochondrial impairment. In the left, we can see the, mitochondrial, the cardiac mitochondria from the control group, and in the right, the damaged uh, mitochondria from the hyperoxia group. And this uh, reflects as a little area and perimeter of this organelle. Moreover, the renin-angiotensin system is one of the most important regulators of the cardiac function, and a previous study already shows that the neonatal high oxygen exposure it leads to an early activation of the renin-angiotensin system with an increase in the H1 receptor and a decrease in the H2 receptor. So, based on that, we here postulated that oxygen-induced cardiomyopathy is associated with impaired cell bioenergetics that can be reversed by the treatment with angiotensin 7 which is a counter-regulatory peptide of the renin-angiotensin system of the beneficial axis. And for that, Spragdolle pups were kept in 80% oxygen from day 3 to day 10 of life. Uh, and I will call this group as OIC, uh, that stands for oxygen-induced cardiomyopathy. And the control group was kept in the room air. This OIC group was then subdivided in more two other groups, the OIC control and the OIC angiotensin 7 that the, at day 22, these rats received uh, osmotic mini pumps containing angiotensin 7 uh, In the day 28, the encardiac echo was performed, and at day 35, the animals were euthanized. For the mitochondrial isolation and the tissue collection, and the isolated isolated fresh mitochondria had the assessment of their function by the, the analysis of the oxygen consumption rate in the oxytherm. And the, L, the left ventricle collected for the RNA extraction and protein isolation for the evaluation of the electron transport chain complexes 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, citrate synthase, exokinase, the main renin angiotensin system components, the mitochondrial superoxide dismutase, SOT2, and also catalase. And first, in the echocardiogram results, we can see that the OIC group presented a decrease in the, both in the ejection fraction and also in the fractional shortening. And those are parameters to evaluate the cardiac function, especially the the, the systolic function of the left ventricle, and these parameters were improved in the group treated with angiotensin 7 Then, when we isolated the fresh mitochondria and assessed their function, we saw that there was no difference in the baseline, but angiotensin 7 restored mitochondrial respiration, increasing the oxygen consumption rate during the state three, uh, which is called which is called the metabolic state three, and this this provides us uh, evidence that angiotensin one to seven is able to increase to improve the oxidative phosphorylation of these animals. Then to evaluate more specifically the alterations in the mitochondria, we 
checked the protein expression of the mitochondrial electrotransport chain complexes, and we saw that angiotensin 1 to 7 decreases the complexes 1 and 2 expression when they are compared to the control group and normalizes the expression of the complexes 3 and 5. However, there was no differences in the complex 4. And together with the data of the mitochondrial function that I presented before, these results show that the treatment with angiotensin 1 to 7 can modulate the oxidative, the oxidative phosphorylation by changes in the electron transport chain. Also, the gene expression of citrate synthase, that is a marker of mitochondrial abundance, was increased in the OIC group, but the treatment uh, with angiotensin 1 to 7 was, a, was able to blunt this effect. And also a similar result was observed in the gene expression of exokinase with an increase in this expression. And uh, angiotensin 1 to, 7, uh, 1 to 7 normalized this parameter. And exokinase is also a marker of less efficient glycolysis. So uh, this data shows that angiotensin 1 to 7 is able to normalize these effects. These, these aspects. Then, after, when we evaluated the renin angiotensin system components, the protein and the gene expression, we saw that angiotensin 1 to 7 treatment blunted the upper regulation in ACE, that is the angiotensin converting enzyme, but it decreased the ACE2 protein expression. The um, hyperoxia also decreased the mass protein, the mass protein expression. No, the mass, sorry, the mass gene expression, but the treatment with angiotensin 1 to 7 was able to uh, normalize its expression. It also uh, normalized the H2 receptor expression, both genic and protein but no, no differences were saw in the H1 receptor. And together, this data show an important modulation of the beneficial axis of the renin angiotensin system in the heart. And then to investigate if the oxidative stress could be involved in these effects, we evaluated the protein expression of catalase and SOD2 that are two important antioxidant enzymes, and we saw that the OIC group presented higher levels of catalase and angiotensin 1 to 7 restored it. And in the other hand, the hyperoxia group decreased the salt to expression, and the treatment also restored it, showing that one of the consequences of the mitochondrial modulation can be an improvement of the oxidative stress but further experiments are now being conducted to evaluate this, this hypothesis. And so together, our results indicate that angiotensin 1 to 7 treatment of the juvenile rats that were exposed to neonatal hyperoxia can prevent the left ventricle systolic dysfunction and also restore the, the left ventricle mitochondrial dysfunction by mo a modulation of the renin angiotensin system and the antioxidant defense system. And very importantly, that this study identified, it, identified a potential therapeutic target for impaired cardiac function that is observed in children and young adults born preterm, or that we, you, you can, could see in the doctor Nguyen's presentation. I would like especially to thank Dr. Anna Monique Nui for having me in her lab for my sandwich PhD. And I, I hope that we, I, I can see you again soon. I, I would also to like Daniela, Ing, Adrienne, Alison, Camille, Mai, and Anik. And also very important, my advisor here in Brazil, Dr. Carlos Henrique Castro. Uh, I would also to like all the Canadian and Brazilian agencies of funding, the graduate program in biological sciences and UFG. So 
Thank you. Maybe Dr. Fernande. Now Please. I got. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you, Carolina, for this nice set of data you showed us. Uh, it brings to us the importance of keeping programs uh, to send our students abroad. And you showed here very nice data. So I think we will start with Dr. Diego Colignati, uh, who is acknowledging you for this excellent speech. And he wants to know if there, are, if there is any data regarding the effects of angiotensin 1 to 7 on mitochondrial function in adult models of heart failure. Uh, I, I don't know about these studies. I, I think... Uh uh only added models no i think it, it, we still don't have uh, I, there there are some studies about the long bronchopulmonary dysplasia that is also accompanied by the preterm birth and also some studies about the the right ventricle but not the mitochondrial function and adjotensin to seven in the adult models Okay, so Larissa Macedo is asking you uh, if you know about any other intracellular mechanisms that could be involved on these effects. Uh, actually, we, were, we are trying to investigate what can be involved. We are trying to see if we can see some other other cardiac remodeling and Jotun 727 can prevent it and this can reflect in the mitochondrial function and also we are investigated the role of the reactive oxygen species more specifically um, okay so i was wondering here uh you do a treatment that takes uh, around how many days with angiotensin one to seven from it's day... about two weeks. Two weeks, okay. Yeah. So do you think the effects that you are seeing, uh, they will long uh, in later life? For example, if we treat these animals in their uh, venue uh, period and then return on their adult life to see if that period uh, treatment uh, with angiotensin 1 to 7 during that short period uh, will endure for later life to pre to prevent uh, this this heart dysfunction, for example. Uh, actually, I, I think yes, because uh, this is part of the data of my PhD mm -hmm. and my project from here in Brazil. We did a treatment of the SHR in the first week, three, three weeks in the in the for uh, the early life and with 19 weeks the animals also had an, an improvement in the cardiac morphology so wait i, I think yes yeah this will be nice because uh, i now i want to chat with james because yeah. uh, i think uh, from something from our last speaker she showed that somehow this is preventing uh, this dysfunction in, in these early ages. Uh, but it will be very hard to convince the physicians to treat uh, youngers with these drugs and without any type of blood, high blood pressure or cardiac dysfunction. Uh, so I think data like yours will bring uh, this sense of urgency to to start doing studies like this, to see if uh, treating during the juvenile stage will prevent later life uh, dysfunctions in the heart function. Yes, and, and it's very interesting because I was wondering about that. 
that maybe we can we can increase angiotensin 1 to 7 concentration not in the pharmacological classic ways we can do by exercise and other and other things so uh, maybe we can we can try this way just to add to uh, what uh, Professor Fernanda has just said, uh, uh, I saw a couple of uh, paper saying that uh, early postnatal, um, uh, early postnatal developmental changes or early postnatal developmental stages are actually very crucial to some of the changes in cardiovascular function, you know, uh, that, you know, could happen, like if you're able to establish uh, or be able to detect some of these changes that you're showing your result at these early stages, uh, definitely that will probably help, you know, in looking at maybe kind of uh, pharmacological intervention, you know, among others that could be helpful, you know. Uh, I would have loved to hear more about the psychiatric aspect, but I know this is not really part of uh, the discussion today. But again, uh, it's been really very nice and productive listening and looking at some of your very interesting data that you presented to us. And that in itself, that's how the science, that's a way we can advance, you know, in science, you bring in this kind of information that to some extent could stimulate you know, additional investigation, especially for some of us that are actually interested in uh, drug screening. You know, it looks like a basic science, but it's, you know, really fundamental to whatever we can do uh, in terms of screening, not just in terms of screening, there are other aspects that are very critical to this presentation, thinking about diagnostic, you know, uh, and some other uh, things that could come up. I don't know, Dr. Professor Fernandez, <laughs> you have something yeah. to add? So I think you are right, not only the screening, but of the repurpose of some drugs uh, that are being used for some, um, some specific conditions, we can make the, uh, the range larger uh, for these drugs. So, Congratulations, Carolina. So I'll take this opportunity to thank my co-chair, Dr. James, who shared uh, this session with me, to say uh, thank you to all the speakers from this afternoon. We had excellent chats here. And I'll, uh, I will use Elizabeth Mendes' comments here. Uh, who is saying that all the presentations are very interesting. We agree with them, don't, don't we? <laughs> and say that uh, we'll be here tomorrow, uh, starting at 8 a.m. and waiting for you. And I think we have a last slide from the organizing committee who wants to invite you to the summer school. James, would you invite our guests here? <laughs> sure, sure. Well, we're, we're already looking forward to another excellent presentations. And for some of you out there, students, uh, some of you that have colleagues in other institutions, please spread the news. Uh, Pepe Jesebe is in for the best. I always get the best from her. So you can save these dates. 10th to 14th of January, 2022. Uh, there's going to be another great opportunity, you know, from UFUJ, from ICB, from PPJCB to the world. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so the students and the organizing committee are preparing a very nice summer course. Uh, please make the news uh, to, to pass to the people who will, uh, who want to attend this uh, very nice opportunity. So thank you very much. We may close the session. And it was a pleasure, James, to be here with you and all this audience. Thank you very much.